Do you know him? Do you know him? If you know him, he knew you before you knew him. If you have your Bible, turn to the book of Genesis chapter 3 with me this morning, please. Genesis chapter number 3 and verse number 20. Genesis 3.20. And Adam called his wife's name Eve, because she was the mother of all living. Father, bless this holy word now. In thy name I pray, amen. You can be seated. The name Eve means life spring or life giving. And of course she is so named by Adam himself. When God made them, he called their name Adam. That is the man and the woman. The word Adam is a generic term that simply means mankind. So therefore God said the man and the woman are mankind. But then when she uh, was named by Adam, she was named Eve because she is the one to bring forth life on this earth. What he's trying to say is that she's very, very important because she is the one that God chooses to bring life into this world. I want to ask you a question. What kind of mother did you have? Since this is Mother's Day, uh, and uh, I'm going to ask you that question, and then you can answer it, and Almighty God will hear the answer that you give Him. What kind of mother did you have? Some of you had outstanding mothers. The kind of mothers that anyone would uh, love to have. And then some of you have had mothers that are far, far, far from what they should have been as mothers. I want to go through a list of a few mothers I have written down here this morning. And I'm going to, as I go through this list, I'd like for you to ask yourself the question, uh, does, uh, does any of these women fit as the kind of mother that I had? And of course the first one is Eve. And if you remember about Eve, she brought Cain and Abel into this world. One of them was a murderer. No doubt in my heart that, that it broke her heart that one of her sons had killed the other one. No doubt about it. But I do believe that in the hours of the evening, Eve no doubt took the opportunity to teach her children about how that at one time they had walked unfettered with God. They'd walked in complete fellowship and joy with the Lord. And because of the entrance of sin, it destroyed that walk with God. So therefore, she taught them about the entrance of sin into the world. That to me is one of the greatest things that a mother could ever teach her children is why we're in a mess we're in now. We're in that mess not because of a lack of, uh, of uh, education or culture or whatever else. We're in the mess we're in today because of S-I-N. And so therefore, it could come from the mouth of the mother to teach her children about sin. And here's another one, Samuel. Do you know whose mother uh, Samuel had for a mother? Her name was Hannah. Hannah, Hannah. And she was barren. And she was the wife of Elkanah. And he had another wife. His name was Penina. And the Bible said that Penina made Hannah's life miserable because Penina had children, but Hannah did, had no children. But Hannah cried out to God. And she asked the Lord to open her womb and give her a child and said, Lord, if you'll open my womb and give me a child, I'll give him back to you. And that's exactly what she did. She was true to her word because when the boy was big enough, she made a little ephod for him and took him to the tabernacle at Shiloh and gave him to God. And so the Lord raised Samuel. He grew up next to the tabernacle. He grew up next to the Holy of Holies. This is why of all the prophets in the Old Testament, none rise higher than Samuel. And when it comes to the life of Samuel, you'll look long and hard to find something bad said about Samuel. He was unique, he was odd, he was different. And that's because his mother Hannah had given him to the Lord. Now folks, I've heard about this in the past. I wonder, did your mother, when she brought you into this world, did she give you to the Lord? You know, the Bible says that our children are in heritage of God. God owns your children, not the state. I know the state gets way out of hand. I understand, Caesar. 
Render to Caesar that which is Caesar's. But Caesar's never happy with what you render to him. He always wants to take more. But your children don't belong to Caesar. They belong to the Lord. Therefore, he lends them back to you. And the Lord says to you parents, I'll trust you to raise your children in the fear and the admonition of God. I don't know of all the things that a parent could do on the face of this earth. Hear me well. You might become a millionaire. You may build monuments. You may do this and you may do that. But when you fail in your children, you failed miserably. The greatest thing that a mother and a father could do is to raise their children in the fear and the admonition of the Lord. And then later on in life, you can look into their eyes and you can say, thank you, Lord, for what you did when you raised my kids because I'm only a vessel in your hands. Hannah did that and they did not come any better than Samuel in the Old Testament. Now, Ahaziah, a lot of folks say, who is Ahaziah? He was the king of Israel and his mother's name was Athaliah. You may not know about Athaliah, but Ahaziah died. And when Ahaziah died, his mother Athaliah killed all the seed royal. She was a vicious murderer. And then she took the throne of Israel for herself. And therefore nobody could stand in her way. What a horrible person to be born under. How many has ever heard of Maul Barker? You ever heard of Maul Barker? She's part of Americana. She's part of American history. She taught her boys how to shoot machine guns, rob banks, and become criminals. A mother and a father can teach right or teach wrong. Listen, folks. Your children think you're God. Your little babies running around think you're the greatest thing in the world. They don't think you could do anything wrong. The influence that you have over your children is unbelievable. It is way beyond what it should be. But that influence can be for good or for bad. And God gave you that, uh, gave you that, I don't know what you want to call it, what do you call it? This interaction you have with your children. And if you have the right interaction with your children, then they will follow you and they'll follow you rightly. And it's a good thing. It ought to be because nobody is more intimate with children than mom and dad. And that's the way it ought to be. But Athaliah was a murderer. And if you read the Bible, you'll find out what happened to her. They cornered her in the very temple of God and they did away with her. Away she went. Live by the sword. Die by the sword. The murderer, murderess, was put to death herself. And so it is that when you send it out, it comes back so good, good will come back. So righteousness, righteousness will come back. So peace and mercy, peace and mercy will come back. So hell and hell will come back. So division and division will come back. So discord and discord will come back. The Bible said, be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, the same shall he also reap. By the grace of God, Isaac had a mother. Do you know who Isaac was? His name means laughter. It's a play on words. It's sarcasm. Did you know that God can be sarcastic? He sure can. Oh, yes. When the Lord appeared to Abraham and said, at this set time next year, your wife is going to have a son. She heard him in the temple. She heard him in the tent. And the Bible said that Sarah laughed. Oh, how she mocked and made fun. Why, what are you talking about having a son? I'm old. I'm an old woman. God Almighty is not interested in how old or how young you are or whether you're able to help him out. He doesn't need your help. When he gets ready to do something, he's going to do what he said he's going to do. And you know what happened with her? At that time, according to the time of life, she brought forth a son into the world. And you know what she called him? She called him Isaac. Yitzhak in Hebrew, and that means laughter. And you know what she said? God has made me to laugh. I laughed in mockery. I laughed in scorn. And now I rejoice and laugh in glory because of what God's done. Mothers, how many of you have God had to bring from a point of unbelief, a point of derision, a point of scorning and mocking and making fun of the Lord where God's not important in your life? He's just something on a piece of paper. You heard about him in Sunday school. He really doesn't matter. And now he's brought you to the point to where you rejoice in the Lord and thank God because his hand is ever present in your life. And he feeds you, clothes you, and you gather your children around you and you look at those kids and you look at them in the face and you think, my goodness, 
What a blessing God has given me to be a mother of all these children. Look what kind of an influence I can have on their life, either for good or for bad. And so Isaac turned out pretty good. He turned out pretty good. When he went to the top of Moriah with his dad Abraham, he said, Father, he said, uh, he said uh, here's the wood. He said, Father, uh, where's the ram? Where's the lamb? And Abraham said, Son, what did he say, brother? God will provide himself a ram. He'll provide the lamb. And he did. Because as Abraham and Isaac went up one side of Moriah, that ram was coming up the other side of Moriah. He was preparing him for the sacrifice unto God. Yes, sir. Isaac had a good mother. Her name was Sarah. Then we read about Moses. Moses had a good mother, too. You may know what Moses' mother's name was. She's not very, not very well known, but the Bible tells you who she was. Her name was Jochebed. His daddy's name was Amram. Amram and Jochebed. Jochebed took her little boy and she put him on an ark and she put him in the Nile River. Did you know that a Nile crocodile can be as long as that bench right there? Did you know a Nile crocodile can be 15 or more feet long? That a Nile crocodile can swallow you whole? Do you realize the danger that was in the Nile River when she put her little boy in that ark? But she put him in the hands of God and there's nobody safer to put him with. Mom, when you go to bed at night, do you say, Lord, here are my children. Would you take care of them and keep them? Would you take care of my babies? The other day I was looking through a thing from the, from the Smoky Mountains. And I don't know if you know this or not, folks, but a number of people have just disappeared in the Smoky Mountains, never to be heard from again. Not one shred of the fact that they'd ever been alive is to be found in the Smoky Mountains. Maybe one day they'll find their little body or they'll find something here or there. But to this day, there are a number of people that have literally disappeared from the face of the earth. There are people whose little children go get on buses and they go to the bus station or the bus stop somewhere to go to school and they never see them again. I don't know if any more hell that a man could live on this earth than that. How could you go to bed at night and lay your head and go to sleep and not know where your son or where your daughter is? And do you understand today, my friend, that the predators are out there right now walking the streets? They want your kids. We live in a pervert society. And all you've got to do is do a little, do a little quick cursory uh, search on the internet. Go to Google and pull up the pages of missing children, missing children, and find it all that's associated with that. Therefore, if you've still got all your kids, and all your babies are there, and your grandchildren are there, and you've got your family you can gather around, you ought to say, thank God Almighty. Thank the Lord that he's watched over my children. This is what uh, Jochebed did when she put Moses out there in the ark. And God took care of Moses. And do you know what? He not only took care of Moses, Moses' mother wound up raising him. Because, Moses, because his sister was planted, Miriam, at the very spot when Pharaoh's daughter looked, who will take care of this child? And Miriam chimed in, which is the New Testament Mary, by the way, the Old Testament Hebrew Miriam. And she chimed in and said, well, I know somebody will take care of him. And so she did. She gave him to the Lord and the Lord gave him back to her. You won't go wrong if you give your kids to the Lord. And the Lord give them back to you. Well, preacher, the school system says this and the state says that. And I've been a shut up. Amen. What does God say? Amen. 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 Raise him in the fear and the admonition of the Lord. John the Baptist's mother. She was a wonderful mother. And so oh, what was her name, preacher? What was John the Baptist? What? Elizabeth. Elizabeth was John the Baptist's mother. She was a good mother. And she was an old woman, had no children. She was barren. And uh, her husband's name was Zechariah, and he was a priest. And they had no children. And what are we going to do, preacher? We have no children. Cry out to God Almighty. Yeah. That's what she did. Yeah. Elizabeth yeah. was barren. And in the land of Israel, folks, barrenness was an indication of the curse of God. For they teach us, they say, that every mother in Israel prayed that she would be the mother of the Messiah that she would bring the Mashiach into the world. So what an honor it would be for her to be the mother of the Messiah. Yet here she was past age, she was like Sarah, she was an old woman, and she was past having children. And the Bible says that God intervened. And when he intervened, things began to change. And 
Has God ever intervened in your life? Has God ever stopped you in your tracks? Has he ever really spoken to your heart? Have you ever really in your life had God speak to you? On the way to church this morning, I passed boats and campers. I passed drunks and thieves. I passed everything under the sun. America, my friend, today is filled with unbelievers. You say, so when I preach, I'm so glad we've got 100 million born again people in the country. Who are you reading? <laughs> what book are you reading from? Well, preacher, 50 million, you sure? I'd be surprised if we got 20 million in this country that are born again. Somebody said, now, preacher, when the rapture takes place, millions will be missing. You kidding? That might have been the case 100 years ago, but not today. I don't, think, I don't think enough people will come up missing to where it'll take anything at all to explain it away. No, aren't many left that are real believers. Not many, not many, not many. John the Baptist had a good mother, though. Elizabeth raised him up. You say, how do you know that, preacher? Because of what he became. What does the Bible say about John the Baptist? Among them that are born of woman, he was born of Elizabeth. Among all the people that have ever lived on the face of the earth, from Adam to John the Baptist, every prophet in the Old Testament, every king, God said among them that are born of women, there hath not risen a greater than John. And I'll tell you right now, folks, that has to put Elizabeth pretty high up on the pole. Yes, sir. She raised that boy right. And when he came of age, he did what he did, he left home and he went out in the desert. He went out into the wilderness. And he started seeking the face of, jo of God. And did you know what, folks? He was kin to the Lord Jesus Christ. Did you know that? He was kin to him. Yep. Same bloodline through Mary and Elizabeth. Had different fathers, of course. But same bloodline through Mary and Elizabeth. And then when he came of age, he came out of the wilderness and he started preaching and prepare the way of the Lord. And my friend John the Baptist wound up good. And he had spiritual discernment. John the Baptist, the Bible said, stood there and he looked at the followers of Christ and his disciples and he said, I am a friend of the bridegroom. In other words, I'm not even part of the body of Christ, but I'm happy. They came to him one day and they said, John, said, your disciples are following Christ. They're leaving you, son. Why, your ministry's a failure. Well, look at you. You came on the scene from nowhere and all of a sudden all these people were gathering around at the Jordan River and you were baptizing them and your name was everywhere and now they're all gone. John, you're a failure. John said he must increase and I must decrease. Boy, if we didn't learn that today, it'd do us some good, wouldn't it? Elizabeth, John the Baptist. Do you know who Timothy's mother was? Timothy's mother her name was Eunice. Eunice. And here's what it says in 2 Timothy 1.5 about Eunice. The Apostle Paul is talking about young Timothy, and here's what he says. He says, When I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in thee, which dwelt first in thy grandmother Lois and thy mother Eunice, and I am persuaded that in thee also. Boy, that's good. The word unfeigned faith means a faith that is not put on. That's what it means. To feign something is to make the appearance of. He feigned uh, 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 being passed out. Or he feigned that he was sick or tired. Unfeigned means in reality and in truth. Timothy was raised in the home of Bible believers. Now, Timothy had a Greek father. You understand, if you go back and read the Bible and study a little bit, you'll find out Timothy's home wasn't perfect. His father was a Greek. He wasn't a Bible believer. He wasn't a Christian. He wasn't a believer. And yet in spite of all of that, Timothy became a true believer in our Lord Jesus Christ. Why? Because the foundation was right. He was, the foundation was laid from the child, he said, thou hast known the holy scriptures which are able to make thee wise unto salvation. 
When I went to rural high school, we used to read the Bible, get up and pray, and speak about Bible lessons in class. When I went to Beaumont Grammar School, we read the Bible, we prayed, we had prayer in school, we had all these things in school. That was one of the redeeming qualities of the public school system back then. We could read the Bible and we could pray. Try it now. From a child thou hast known the holy scriptures that are able to make thee wise unto salvation. In the first few years of a child's life, what it, hear, what it hears, what it takes in, develops that child's character. It forms what that child is going to be. I'm thankful, thank God, for Beaumont Baptist Church when I was no bigger than this right here that I went, to, I went to Sunday school at Beaumont Baptist Church and my Sunday school teacher got up and taught me the Word of God. I believed it then. But then when they started feeding evolution into my mind and corrupting my heart and my soul, I abandoned the scripture and I followed the way of Cain and the way of hell of this earth. I rejected the Lord Jesus Christ and the word of God. And then in 1973, God came to me. He came back to me. He came back to me. And when he spoke into my heart, he said, I want your attention. And when he said it, it didn't come from here, it didn't come from there, it came from there, and I knew it. And something was speaking to me that was much bigger than I am. And I listened. I listened. I listened. From a child, I knew the Holy Scriptures that were able to make me wise into salvation. But I allowed myself to become prey to this world. And they corrupted the Word of God in my heart. They corrupted it. But thank God he came to me. You can beat your head against a wall. You can walk up and down this aisle. You can, run, you, can do, you can do everything you can. You're blue in the face and you will not convert one soul to Christ until he comes to them. When Christopher was saved the other night, nobody had to lead him to the Lord. You're getting in the, you're getting in the way. You're in the way. When he came under conviction, it was the kind of conviction that shook his foundation and his soul. He broke out in a sweat. His heart rate increased. He knew he was lost without God. That's conviction. Then what happened, preacher? The Holy Ghost led him to Christ. Leading someone to the Lord is far more than words that you quote and words that you read and prayers that you pray. Leading someone to the Lord Jesus Christ can only be done by the Spirit of the living God who brings you to the Son and awakens your soul to your need for Him and makes Him come alive in your heart and then you're born again. I've been in the church a while and I've watched a lot of duds. I saw a few duds in here not too long ago, a few weeks ago, some duds. They made a profession of faith in Christ, walked out the door, their life is just like it was before, nothing changed. Just as dead as they were at that time. But there's a man sitting right over there right now who's not a dud. Real conviction came upon his soul just like Christopher. He came face to face with God and God saved him, and when he saved him, he changed him, and he put joy in his soul. I know you want your loved one saved. I know you do. I understand that. I sympathize with that. I really do. I know you want them saved. And some of you still believe that there's some kind of a magic bullet, some kind of a magic thing. If you get, just get the right person, get them in the right place, do the right, say the right, that's not, so good, that's not going to do it. No man can come to me, he said, except the Father which hath sent me draw him. Amen. But he drew me in 1973. That's why I'm the way I am to this very day. When it comes to the conversion of sinners, I know what got me saved. If you had tried to use trickery on me and tried to use high pressure evangelism on me, I would have looked you in the face and told you where to get off. That's the kind of person I was. That's what I was. But boy, when something came on me from another world, and I could not deny it. Amen. It was powerful. Amen. Well, see, preacher, I've never had that happen. Well, then why don't you ask him to let it happen? Amen. Let's just be honest this morning. Let's talk face to face. Listen, forget that you're here in preaching. Let's just talk to each other. Amen, brother. Good. 
When are you ever going to come face to face with the fact you're going to hell one day and you don't want to go to hell and you know there's a God up there in heaven and you want to be saved but you're as dead as you know you can ever be. You're dead as dead, dead as Poppy said at four o'clock. That's what my grandfather used to say. Then why don't you quit playing around and hiding behind people and hiding behind excuses and trying to flim flam God? Why don't you just come out and say, Lord God, convict me. Amen, 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 amen. Convict me. Amen. I double dog dare you. I'm serious as a heart attack. I dare you. You don't believe there's a God in heaven and you got nothing to worry about. If there is a God in heaven and you get serious with God and you come under real Bible conviction for the first time in your life, it'll scare you to death. Then you're ready to be saved. The fact of the matter is that once real conviction takes hold of the heart of a human being, salvation's incidental. Amen. That's just part of it. Because Amen. that's exactly where he leads you to. Amen. He will lead you to salvation. We've paraded people, we've paraded people down in front of the church. We've paraded them up here in the pulpit. They've given their testimony ad nauseum down through the years. We've watched people come and watch people go and all tuck and shout and hoop and holler for a little while and talk about being saved and they're no more saved than a dog. Right, man. I challenge you. That's right. Nobody has to be around. Nobody. That's right. Amen. Nobody. Amen. Just you and God. Amen. And say, God, convict me. Thank you, Jesus. I'm afraid to, preacher. That's the problem. You don't really, you don't really want to be converted. You'd be uncomfortable then. You'd lose your, you'd lose the people you hide behind. That's right. If I were to take a survey this morning of everybody in this auditorium, some of you would have 15 people you're hiding behind right now. That's right. You could give me a list of all the people. Well, I know this preacher that went off with this woman, and I know this preacher that's rich. And now what happened? And why did this happen? And how come so-and-so died? And I've seen so much, and this and that. And this You're hiding behind all this stuff. You've got a list of all the stuff you're hiding behind. I challenge you. Throw your list down and yes, say to him, yes, yes. convict me. Yes. And then here's the last one. Our Lord Jesus Christ. Who is his mother? Mary. Now let me say this. I'm not a Mariolater. I am not. I do not. I believe the Catholic Church goes way overboard. They go too far. But I believe there's an awful lot of Baptists around here. Don't go far enough. She was not just another woman. You need to get that in your soul this morning. Mary, the mother of Jesus, was not just another woman. From this time forth, all men shall call thee blessed she was the virgin daughter of Zion. She was the only woman that ever walked the face of this earth that had a son without a human father. She was a virgin when she was, when she was impregnated by the Holy Spirit. That was a divine act of God. Mary was a, was, was a servant of the Lord and Mary was a true follower of the faith of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. There's only one Mary, only has been one Mary, never will be another Mary. And she should be honored and respected by every one of us in this house today, we should say, she's the mother of our Lord Jesus Christ. She's different. Yes, she is. But she was also a sinner that needed to be saved. And the last thing the Lord said to her when he was hanging on the cross and John the Apostle was standing next to her was, woman, didn't even call her mother, behold thy son. In plainer words, he was being gentle and nice and sweet with his mother. He was saying, Mary, I am no longer your son and you're my mother and that mother-son relationship. I'm your Lord God and Savior. That's your son, John. And you must accept that simple fact. I love you, Mary. You're my mother. You brought me into this world. And he loved his mother, no question about that. But she was like all the rest of us. I disagree with the Catholics there again. They believe in the Immaculate Conception. They believe that Mary was born without original sin. I don't believe that. I believe Mary was born under the same curse, curse as all the rest of us. 
but she was divine and protected by the hand of God. She was a vessel prepared of the Lord to bring his son into this world. We should love her, honor her, and respect her because there's only one Mary, but she needed to be saved just like all the rest of us. In plain of words, I guess Mary, brother, would be the epitome of what motherhood's about because she was the mother of our Lord Jesus Christ. And I love these mothers. I'll tell you right now, I've seen mothers suffer. I've watched what they've had to endure down through the years. It's a horrible thing sometimes when you see what God allows a woman to go through. I guess a lot of that is to humble, to humble us men, you know? To humble us sometimes. To teach us a lesson. Life is not a cheap thing. Life is a, life, life is a precious thing. And a woman goes through the valley of the shadow of death to bring life into this world. And men give lip service to it, but they don't really understand what a woman goes through. I've seen some of it down through the years. I appreciate it. I appreciate it greatly. And I also know the influence that a mother can have on her son and her daughter. I know the influence. Mothers, let me ask you this question this morning. Has your influence been good on your children? Do they rise up as it says in the book of Proverbs and call thee blessed? or not. When a woman reaches her senior years and gathers her children around them, and we'll be going to a house in a little while where a 92-year-old mother, a 92-year-old mother will gather her children around them, and all of those children love her dearly. I've known her now since 1966, 48 years, and you couldn't ask for a better mother on the face of this earth. And I realize I have a privilege. I'm pastor up here preaching. Many of you could say the same thing. I understand that. But she is one blessed woman. Lord. Every one of her children love her. They all love her. They all respect her. She went out. She'd get up early in the morning and get on a bus and drive off to, ride off to uh, uh, the Levi's and work all day long and never received a dime of help from anybody. Work all day long and come back and take every cent she had to feed those kids and put a roof over their head and take care of her children. Now that's the kind of mother she was. You couldn't ask for a better mother than that. Some of you had a mother like that. Some of you still have a mother like that. She's still alive. This is her day. You ought to thank God for that. I didn't. But if you do, good for you. Mother's Day is a mixed motion day for me. So what I do is she becomes my mother. Edna Goins, my mother. She's been a mother to me all these years. Been a good one, buddy. Been a good one. Been a good one. Been a good one. Kiss your mother. Hug her. Tell her you love her. Show her you love her. Let her realize how wonderful it is for all it means to be a mother that brought you into this world. Hallelujah to God. But she is what she is by the grace of God. Amen. Amen. By the grace of God. Won't you hug her? Stand up. Let's all stand up. You got a mother in here today. You still got your mother. If she's not where you are, go where she is and hug her. Tell her you love her. But you do it because you do love her. That's a precious gift from God, folks. Precious, precious gift. <laughs> precious, precious gift. Precious gift. Mothers, we honor you. We love you. God bless you. What a precious thing it is to have a good godly mother. God bless you, mothers. You have my respect. I respect you. I respect you. Motherhood is a marvelous thing. I respect you. This godless, pervert society we live in today has degenerated. It's diminishing motherhood. Never, it's not so in Scripture, not so in the church of God. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Mary, one of a kind. Not another Mary, never will be another Mary. Was never, was never another Mary before her, never be another Mary after her. Notice carefully. God chose the woman to be the means to bring salvation into this lost and dying world. Had it not been for the mother, there would have been no God-man. And you are saved because of the God-man, the Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Amen. All right. Brother, uh, 
Let's sing something. Brother Sylvia, come on up here. Precious day. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Precious day. Page 375 in your All American. <coughs> precious, precious day. Oh, mothers.